G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. In today's video, we are doing a part two to the bold predictions video I made about a week ago on the channel. So the premise of that video was you guys through Instagram and the YouTube uh, community tab would submit your boldest predictions for 2024 and I compiled them all into a video and rate them one by one. Now, like I said in the last video, there have been so many submissions, I couldn't possibly do them all in one. So I've had to do it in two. And again, I've had to skim off the top a little bit. There were some didn't didn't quite make it. There was a few double ups, etc as well. That being said, we've still got quite a few to run through today and I'm going to go through them one by one and tell you my thoughts on your bold predictions. Like I said, if you didn't come across part one, there is another video to watch after this with completely different bold predictions and while you're there, make sure you are subscribed to this channel for plenty of AFL content. So let's kick things off and get straight into these bold predictions, okay? So the first one is from AFL Talks and it is that Adelaide will start the season four and oh. So four wins, zero losses. Okay, looking at the fixture here, I quite like this one. So their first fixture is against the Gold Coast Suns away from home and that could be tricky, okay? But then after that, they've got Geelong in Adelaide. I feel like they've beaten them there in recent times and uh, I'd imagine I'd probably be fancying Adelaide in that game. Frio in Perth. That's a tricky one, not simple. It depends what kind of Fremantle we see in 2024. The Demons in Adelaide. And then the fifth game is Carlton away. And I presume you didn't tip Adelaide per se in that game. So the Suns and Frio away. And then the Cats and the Ds at home. You know what? There's a decent chance that happens. I quite like that from AFL Talks. Luke McMahon has gone absolutely large with this one and suggests that eight coaches will depart this season. And I will note the, the phrasing of it as depart, which means that not all of them necessarily may be sacked but some may resign, okay? So I'm trying to pick this one apart. Who would be the eight if hypothetically eight left, okay? So I did, did a recent tier maker ranking uh, coaches by the perceived pressure on them at the moment. So in the in the first bracket, you know, Beveridge and Simpson seem like they're under the most pressure and could conceivably lose their jobs this year. I'm not saying I'm betting on it. We're just plucking the names that it could be. Then there's Brad Scott and Justin Longmuir. Again, there's a degree of pressure there. That's probably the next two. So we've got four that a, a chance, you'd have to say. Then I'm thinking like, what's the next bracket of coaches that could conceivably either be sacked or resign this year? I mean, Simon Goodwin comes to mind. I'm not gonna bet on that, but in isolation, you know, there's a chance. Ken Hinckley, oh, there's always seems to be pressure on him. Matthew Nix, if he has a horrible year, that's probably, we're up to seven now and I really am pushing it. So who's the eighth one? I think you're probably looking at like, Chris Scott packing the shits and, and leaving. Same thing with Michael Voss. I, I don't know. I think after about the first four, it gets really tricky. I'm going to say it's actually more likely that zero coaches get sacked this year than more than four. I think there's more chance that Beveridge and Simpson, who are under the most pressure, don't get sacked and survive than all of the coaches I just mentioned, or even just four of them. We've got a cluster of Port Adelaide predictions next. We have Raz894 saying Port will miss the eight, can get the sack. Then we have John Lang saying Port Adelaide drop all the way to 12th, describing them as flakier than a croissant, and that Hinkley will resign, at, resign out of pure frustration. I suppose that is possible if they do finish 12th. For whatever reason, there seems to be an expectation that Port will flounder this year. And maybe it's because Hinkley is not in a contract year. I think they're too good to, to miss the eight, to be honest. I think their young nucleus there is so good and so powerful. The only vulnerability is if they're not getting enough around that, but they have made moves to refresh their list. They traded in heaps of key position players. So I think this is a long shot. I think I think they should be around the mark for top four. Jack Bleishk then has another Port Adelaide prediction, and that is that Mitch Georgiatis will be Port Adelaide's best forward this year. And this has a little bit of juice to it. So what I'll say is, if we measure it objectively and say, will Georgiatis kick the most goals for Port Adelaide, then it becomes interesting because I look at their last year's goal scorers. Finn Layson was the top goal scorer, if I read it right, and he kicked 38. Marshall was then next with 33, and then a couple of smaller players in SPP with 31. That's a great season. Rioli kicked 31. The other contenders you have in here are, you know, Charlie Dixon, if he gets back to full fitness, and Ollie Lord seems to be rising up the ranks as well. I think if, if we set it as 38 goals is what he's got to aim for, I think that is totally within his wheelhouse. Will he keep more goals than, say, a Todd Marshall next year? I'd probably bet against it. But we could see his output being around the mark for the top three or so. Oscar Batch then throws in a prediction. This is ballsy. I 50% agree with this one. He has two All-Australians next year in Finley McRae and Isaac Quainer. So Finley McRae, I think that one is kind of completely out of the realms of possibility. I think he's got to establish himself as a best 22 player. I think that would be a bold prediction. Maybe not super bold. Like there's a good chance that happens from what I hear. Uh, but him becoming an All-Australian midfielder in his first full season in the 22 would be just 
insane. Uh, Isaac Quainer though, I do like this one. I did a video recently uh, called First Time All Australians We Could See This Year. Isaac Quainer was the thumbnail. And I do genuinely see that as having real possibility. So I half like that one. BW Footy predicts that Q clashes will be the best state rivalry game. What it would require is Gold Coast becoming a genuinely good team. And I don't think that's too crazy. I, I think obviously there's a hard work factor. Um, you know, if, if they push themselves to be in the finals mix, they could deliver some seriously good games. And we have seen some quirky Q, Q clashes before. I think of last year as the most recent example where Gold Coast just kind of belted Brisbane out of nowhere. So maybe, that being said, we are looking at a year where I think rivalries are going to be pretty nuts. The Pies and the Blues, that, that counts as a state rivalry, right? That's going to be a huge clash, you'd think. And then the showdowns. The showdowns are going to be unreal. I expect both teams to be playing finals next year, potentially two top six teams. And I think even when the Crows and the Power aren't good at the same time, they generally do produce interesting showdowns. So that one's a bold prediction, but I, I expect we, we might see some good Q clashes this year. Lockie Box says Harley Reid to poll 15 plus votes in the Brown Low, in brackets, assuming he plays half back. Yeah, so I think Reid will play a mixture of half back and midfield. This one. I would be amazed because I think that would kind of rely on us winning enough games to generate 15 votes. That's a huge variable in uh, in, in players getting brown low votes. Like Tim Kelly was by far and away our best player and had a really good year, but I'm not sure how many votes Tim Kelly polled, but probably not quite what he deserved because we were on the receiving end of so many batterings, he would have missed out on votes. So by that logic, Harley Reid exceeding that output and getting 15 votes, I, I think... I can't see it, as much as it would be amazing. Geelong Memes predicts Jai Clark as the rising star winner. This one would be one of the biggest surprising rising star winners, maybe since Lewis Taylor in 2013. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I feel like a lot of them have been pretty much in a handful of players that you expect. And I think Jai Clark's got to overcome some serious guns this year. There's two at North, McCurcher and Wardlaw, who I think will be right in the mix. Riley Sanders, over time, I'm increasingly thinking he's a good chance. There's Harley Reid, of course. I think there's too many to overcome. But I suppose as a Geelong supporter, that is your wishful bold prediction. I mean, he's a good player, but Rising Star would be a massive win. King Dreamer predicts that Uze gets Richmond back to the top eight. I think this one is very predicated on them getting the absolute best out of their top end players, which are still pretty damn good. So we've obviously got Dusty in that's this team, Tom Lynch. You know, what, what's the situation there with Tom Lynch? I, I believe he's not going to be, you know, fully fit. I don't think he's getting a preseason. I think that's going to hurt them. Um, you know, Shea Bolton, Jaden Shaw. Yeah, I mean, we could see good years from these guys. I think, I think I'm pretty comfortable betting against it. Uh, that being said, I am useless with ladder predictions. Matt McCann says, Bailey Williams will kick 30 plus goals this season. Uh, this one, so Bailey Williams is highlighted for some more forward time. I would be shocked if he gets 30. I think I'd be happy with half that. If if he's playing as a secondary ruck, maybe 20 goals would be a pretty nice season from Bailey Williams. The thing for me is like, he's worked a lot on his contested grabbing. I'd like to see him sort of around the ground as a high marking uh, Ford who's pushing up and, and sort of breaking up play. I, I'm a little bit worried about his set shots, whether it'd be reliable enough to kick 30. So I, I obviously love the West Coast optimism in these videos. That being said, I don't see it. Brendan Foster predicts that Dacos, I presume Nick, will have a match with 50 disposals. It seems high, but I feel like he's just too good in preseason, or he's looked too good in preseason, says Brendan. So I actually think this is quite possible. You know, I, I think of other players who have hit 50 disposals in a game. Uh, I know that Scott Thompson from Adelaide did it. Gary Ablett would have done it a few times. I feel like Dane Swan at least got close. Has Matt Crouch or Lockie Neal ever done it? I, I never looked that up, but I, I feel like maybe those guys got close. So it is possible. We have seen it in the modern game, and I think if anyone's going to do it, Nick Dacos is the biggest accumulator of possession that I can remember. Tom Green is probably another one, but I can see Nick Dacos doing it. The fact that his PB, I think, is 42 disposals in his second season means it's entirely possible. So I, I like this. This is a good bold prediction. Jay Jolly predicts that both Queensland f teams miss the finals and both WA teams miss it. This is probably the most audacious prediction I have seen in the two videos I've done so far. Uh, I cannot see it, mate. If if that, this happens, I will buy you a carton. If you're under 18, I'll, I'll buy you... <laughs> If you're under 18, I'll give you a, a hearty high five. Raz894 predicts Noah Long to have 30 plus goals in a sneaky AA. Oh man, I, I love talking up Noah Long, but this would be such a ridiculous long shot. But I don't think he has, I don't think he has necessarily the same danger around goals 
You know, he kicked seven goals from 19 games. I think his value is up the ground as a playmaker. He just turns, you know, half opportunities into into scoring involvements. I think I think he's going to be that sort of player. I don't see him getting enough volume to either kick 30 goals or be AA. I think he could be winning an All-Australian jumper in his career, but next year is probably a little bit too audacious. We've got a couple from uh, Fidget1764 Frio Fan Man. That's a mouthful. Uh, must be a nightmare filling out paperwork. It says, neither Collingwood nor Brisbane make the top three, but one of them makes the granny. And Ben Williams says, Collingwood to miss the top four. So sticking with the first one for a minute, neither are Collingwood or Brisbane to make the top three but one of them will play in the grand final. So that means maybe fourth and fifth. So the team that finishes fourth, you'd think is more likely to make the grand final because the grand finalists usually come from the top four, right? So who is the more likely out of those two? Ben obviously thinks that Brisbane is the more likely because he thinks Collingwood will miss the top four. I kind of agree with that. I mean, Collingwood obviously were the best team in the in the league last year, but I think they're a little bit more vulnerable to more injuries. So we're obviously going into this season without Dan McStay. And sure, you know, their, their fans are optimistic about the, the reinforcements, but I think they're more vulnerable. Like if they lose a Darcy Moore touch wood, you know, then I think they're far more exposed and likely to slide down. Whereas Brisbane, I think if you take out Andrews or Neil or Charlie Cameron, like one of those, then I think they're a lot more stable and they're generally, generally a little bit more resilient with injuries they've had a good injury run generally speaking so i think brisbane's probably the safer bet there but i I like it i like the bold prediction luke buchanan predicts north melbourne will make the top 12 melbourne will fall out of the eight and the giants will win the flag these are really bold again probably worth a carton if you get all three of those right mate i think the giants winning the flag is conceivable yeah i think they're a damn good team uh, Melbourne falling out of the eights would rely on them kind of imploding, not from a talent point of view. I think the talent is well and truly top four. North Melbourne top twi- 12 seems way too early for me. I think we have to also look at how much experience they just lost and how many games they're going to give to young kids, presumably. I expect improvement, but top 12 would be insane. Like if Clarkson gets into the top 12 with the current list that they have with the agent experience of it, I'll be blown away, absolutely blown away. Tom Ward says West Coast will be a top eight side and Coast Club says West Coast will win eight games. So two, both optimistic, one more so than the other. So I I think top eight is kind of really out of the realms of possibility, really. But I do think eight wins is possible if we have a good run with injury. Looking at the fixture, it is hard to pick out eight games. So again, I'd probably probably think maybe six optimistically is, is about right for us, but eight would be a great result. Cooper Yates predicts the Hawks start three and one after tough first four games. So look, let's look at Hawthorne's fixture. They start the season in round uh, one, uh, or opening round is first, and then there's round one. Uh, they play Essendon at the MCG. Then they play Melbourne at the MCG, and then Geelong at the MCG. Then the Pies in gather round in Adelaide. So Cooper doesn't doesn't say which game he expects them to lose. Obviously, you know, they they beat Collingwood last year. Did they beat Geelong last year? I don't think they did. I think they lost to Geelong. I could be wrong on that. Each of those games in isolation is winnable. Uh, You know, the fact that they beat Collingwood last year would probably give them some confidence. I think the most likely result is 2-2, and that's looking at it optimistically. Like, would they beat Essendon in round one? Maybe. I mean, that's a pretty 50-50 call. And then Geelong at the G, again, it kind of depends how good Geelong are. And regardless, though, Hawthorne do seem to play well against them. Melbourne at the G would be a tough ask. And the Pies, even though they beat them last year, I don't think I would bet on it. But, like, that would be a great prediction if you got it right. Levi McIntosh predicts the top three in the Rising Star all from North Melbourne. I kind of get why you think that, because I can think of at least three examples that should go close. So, McKercha and Wardlaw will be in the top handful of favourites, in my opinion, like... Absolute contenders to win the whole thing. Dersman's probably more of a long shot, but possible. You know, I could see him clunking a few marks and kicking a few goals this year, but probably not top three. And then there's a lot of North fans, including Ollie McCoy, which is the next bold prediction. He predicts Braden George to win the Rising Star. There is a lot of hype around Braden George. I would just temper expectations. I know this kid's missed a lot of footy. And uh, as far as I know, I think he's more of a dynamic, high marking forward which I think makes it harder to win the Rising Star when you're competing against McKercher, who's going to be playing off a halfback flank, and Wardlaw, who can probably already mix it in the midfield. So I think McKercher and Wardlaw will be in the mix, injury notwithstanding. Uh, that being said, top three in the Rising Star all from one club is is going to be, that would be beyond bizarre. Lucas Green predicts Jacob Van Royen to finish top five in the Coleman. So last year, he kicked 28 goals from 20 games, and I had a look, and you needed about 54, five goals let's call it it's, it's a bit messy because there were goals kicked after after the home and away season ended obviously let's call it 55 goals 
to finish top five in 2023. So can he double his output in one year? No, I think he's a gun. I do think he's a gun, but I think it's going to take longer for him to really reach that that standard. Ben QLD predicts Ashton Moy a rising star and premiership player. You know what? I think Carlton winning the flag is is within possibility. Like I don't think that's ridiculous. Ashton Moyer is also very much a high level talent, but like whether or not a he fulfills that potential and b does it in his first season, that's the part that's obviously going to be make or break here. That being said, like it's not absolutely bizarre i think he's got the talent to really make waves but obviously that's very very audacious j stee or j sti i'm gonna call you j stee for obvious reasons uh predicts frio bottom two no one seems to be talking about how ordinary they were in 23 uh so, and brackets from a salty west coast fan <laughs> i like the honesty uh i don't see it i don't see it i think last year will be as as, as mediocre as freeman will get for a little while to be honest um, I, I do think the, the loss of Schultz hurts, but I don't think it propels them back down into the bottom two. I don't think there's too much chance of that. Uh, and I do think that out there in the media, a lot of people are negative on Fremantle from what I've noticed. Uh, Edo Bado says, Darcy Parrish finishes top three in the brown low. I think this one would, would be kind of crazy. He'd have to recapture that 2021 form and some. But you know what? Who would have thought that Ollie Wines would win the brown low during the 2020 season? And then he won it in 21. So who am I to say that it's a bad prediction? But I think that Darcy Parrish has his limitations and I'd be very surprised. That being said, he is the style of player who tends to win the brown low, like that really first possession um, inside clearance winning mid. So stylistically, it kind of makes sense. He has been good before, still decent without being top level. I think 2021 was his best season. Uh, that being said, bowl call. An appropriate handle says three teams will make finals that didn't last season. I agree that's that's probably always going to happen, um, as he points out. But he reckons Adelaide, Gold Coast, and Fremantle. That's interesting. That is interesting. I see Adelaide, yes. I think Gold Coast and Fremantle, maybe. Fremantle is probably still going to take a little bit longer, I think. Probably because of the fact that they, you know, they're bleeding goal scorers a little bit. And I think Lockie Shaw's is an underrated play out outside of WA and therefore to lose 30 odd goals and a top five best and fairest player multiple times I think I don't think there's going to be an easy fix for that that being said they also played well below their expectations and their standard a lot in 2023 so I actually don't think that any of those three teams are crazy in isolation and Gold Coast for me I, I personally just think it could happen this year. It's more likely to take a little bit longer for them to click under Hardwick, but I don't mind that prediction. Queen Poppy is hot also chimes in with Gold Coast will not only make finals and win a final. I, I think the talent profile is there. I think the distribution of quality is there. What I mean by that is good young midfield, um, you know, with led by Took Miller. Rao could explode. I think that's a key variable here. King and Lacocious are a pretty dangerous forward duo. They kicked 79 goals between them last year. You, you think they will improve as well as young players. And down back, they're solid with Ballard and Collins, etc. And there's a few there's a few quality players there. Flanders is another one. So they, they could explode. They could. I just think logically, it rarely happens with a coach in his first season. Kingsley is the exception to this and Hardwick is a gun. But I do wonder whether it would take a while to adjust to a Hardwick style of play, or whether Hardwick will even come in and employ anything like the Richmond one, or will he curate something for Gold Coast talent? It's probably more likely than the latter. So maybe, maybe. I don't think it's absolutely crazy, but because it's Gold Coast, naturally we're all just a bit like, oh, probably not. <laughs> We've got a few West Coast ones here. Ground Up Footy says, the boldest call I can think of is West Coast not finishing last. Is that is that a backhanded sort of compliment? Caden <laughs> uh, Duraisha, forgive me if I'm saying that wrong. West Coast will be better than Essendon, Frio, and North. Bold calls. I don't think that West Coast have the talent profile of Essendon. I think Essendon's talent is there. I think for them, it's between the years, to be honest which does make them like a slight candidate to sort of have a really bad season, but I wouldn't bet on it. Uh, I'd be stoked if we finished higher than Fremantle, but I'd, again, I just think a lot of their best players are you know, a fair bit more mature than ours, or it's going to be that way, way for a while. I, I don't think it's absolutely crazy if we pip them in a derby, but again, that's optimistic Eagles fan. Uh, North Melbourne, I do think there is a good chance we finish higher, which again might make people bristle, but I, it's more down to age and experience than anything else. It, North have shed a lot of experience, as have we, but I think with the, again, the possibility of players coming back from injury, if they can stay fit, play together for a period of time, I think we're more likely to have more wins than North Melbourne. 
But just as I say that, Doyler's AFL says West Coast will have a good injury run but still get the spoon. <laughs> yeah, that's really taking the wind out of my sails. Uh, you know what? Look, I'm not, I can't really argue against that from a position of strength. Um, but again, I, I don't know how to more creatively make the same point that I've made over and over again. But I just think when you think about it, no team in the history of any sport that I've seen has dealt with the injuries that West Coast have. And again, if you want my more nuanced thoughts, I've done a whole video on how West Coast became the worst team in the AFL. And I know that it's not just injuries. That being said though, like the sheer amount of injuries means that I don't think we've been judged fairly at all. So boon contender, yes. I don't think this is a terrible prediction by you. There is a chance, absolutely. Uh, but I would obviously defend the Eagles in that case. And last but not least, Gary Jeffrey says, Simon Goodwin to depart Melbourne and Clayton Oliver to have half a season off for personal reasons. I'm reluctant to comment or make predictions about a player's off-field issues, to be honest. Um, I just hope that doesn't happen. I hope that doesn't happen. And if Simon Goodwin departs Melbourne, I would imagine that's because I've slipped out of finals, but I would hope he stays on anyway. Anyway, guys, these have been your bold predictions for season 2024. If you want me to do this again, um, fire some more in the comment section and I can do a part three if you want. Uh, I think the first one was fairly well, well received. Hopefully this one is as well. So let me know in the comments what you want me to react to in the third edition of this and we'll keep this going for a little bit longer before the preseason. Probably just one more. But anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you for being subscribed and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.